Hello, and welcome to Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. What do you think you learned from the experience? I learned what it felt like to be in control in a way that I had never experienced before because as a blind person, no matter how competent you are, when you're in a sighted context, sighted people are going to be able to assess a situation and react more quickly and easily. And in the dining room, all of those people were in a completely unfamiliar environment. They were fish out of water, but I was just doing my thing. So I had a commanding presence in that room that I've never had anywhere else. Yes, indeed. When the lights are out, sometimes the blind people have the advantage over the sighted people. Dining in the dark restaurants have opened in many countries. We'll speak with Christine Malik, an author and massage therapist and podcaster, about the two years she spent as a blind waitress in a totally dark restaurant. She describes the dining and serving experience and what she learned both about herself and about her customers. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip is... As it says on the wall at Eau Noir, the dark restaurant in Toronto where Christine worked, there is no darkness but ignorance. I am a sailor, sailor brisk, and oft have sailed the ocean. I've traveled the country the far and near for honor for and promotion. Among other things, Christine is also an amateur musician, and that was her singing all the parts of Rambling Sailor, an old traditional tune. Let's start by meeting Chris and learning about her writing and massage therapy jobs. Hi, my name is Chris Malik. I am a writer and massage therapist, and I live in Toronto, Canada. Many of our listeners have visual impairments. Do you? I do. I'm totally blind. I have a little bit of light perception, but functionally, I'm I'm totally blind. You want to tell us a little bit about how you got into writing and massage therapy? It's an interesting combination of professions. Oh, well, they're surprisingly complementary because the profession of writer is uh, very unpredictable and you're unlikely to make a lot of money at it. That's pretty low on the probability scale. But uh, massage therapy is, if you get enough work, it pays quite well. Uh, of course, getting the work is, is part of the challenge too, but it's work that is paying you very well for a short number of hours, which is to say that you end up working a certain number of hours per week, but it leaves you other time, free time, to uh, pursue things like writing, which may not be as immediately profitable. So I chose massage therapy deliberately for some of those reasons, and writing is just something I've always loved to do. Oh, that does sound like a great combination. And I guess massage therapy is an ideal profession for a visually impaired person. It's very tactile. Uh, yeah, it's definitely perceived in that way. And, and sometimes people say, oh, you must be really good at it. And, and I have no way to judge that. So I always say, you just have to ask my clients about that. But definitely in certain parts of the world, it's sort of the expected profession for visually impaired people to pursue. And I, I would say there is a disproportionate number of massage therapists who are blind versus uh, blind people in, in other professions. And what is the focus of your writing? My passion is historical fiction, and so I've self-published a historical fiction novel, and I'm currently working on Harry Potter fan fiction, which is historical. It's the founding of Hogwarts. And so I write a lot of different types of things, blog posts and short stories and essays, but my, my passion is, is historical writing, historical fiction writing. So at the end of the show, we'll be asking you for contact information and how people can find this book. But I read a little summary of it, and it sounds very intriguing. Can you describe the basic plot theme? 
Oh, yes. Thanks. So it's set in 16th century France and Scotland. The story is about a young lady who is bargained into an arranged marriage and she goes from France to Scotland to be married. And it's about the sort of subversive relationship she has with a woman who is her sort of chaperone attendant. And so the book has a lot to do with coming of age, but also about loyalties and with a good dose of sex and religion, which makes everything more interesting. <laughs> And what's it called? It's called Beltane, B-E-L-T-A-N-E, -E, and that's the Celtic word for May Day, the celebration of May Day. Huh. Support for Eyes on Success is made possible in part by our corporate partners. Find out more about partnership opportunities by sending an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is Chris's experiences as a waitress at a completely dark restaurant. What we wanted to focus on today with you was you had an interesting experience being a waitress in a restaurant where the lights were turned out and sighted people were invited to experience eating as if they were blind. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, so this phenomenon started in Europe and there are sort of restaurants dotted around the globe, I believe. And the experience is meant as a sort of a novelty, I guess you might say. That's a complicated question, but one of its meanings is that it's a novelty for sighted people. And so sighted guests come to the restaurant and they eat their meal in complete darkness. They can't see their hand in front of their face, sort of darkness. So it's an experience that takes sighted people completely out of their comfort zone uh, in many respects and gives them a different perspective on life for a couple of hours. And how did you get involved in this? It came across somewhere that I read or heard about that they were looking for servers who are blind or visually impaired. That's a requirement as a server uh, that you are blind or visually impaired. And I was pretty skeptical at first. And then I spoke with a couple of friends, sighted friends who had gone as guests, and they spoke really powerfully about their experience of what it was like. And they were respectful and curious and open and, and not making assumptions. And just approached it with a really open curiosity. And when I heard them talk about that, it occurred to me that whatever the intention of the restaurant is, the effect is that a lot of people are going to have a unique experience that at least is related to being blind. And then my sort of mercenary side thought, well, if someone else is going to make money off of this, I'm going to make money off of it too. So I applied and was given the job as a server. Did you have any experience waiting tables beforehand? Oh, no. In fact, uh, that was, I sort of have the short list of occupations that as a blind person, I never expect to pursue like brain surgery and diamond cutting and, and server is definitely on that list. Well, I assume that they restrict the wait staff to being blind people because they want wait staff that's good at navigating without seeing. Yes, that is the basic intention. And interestingly, a few of my colleagues were partially sighted. And um, I think a couple of them walked on the street without canes, like they had that level of functional vision. And yet, A, they were hired and B, they did fabulously. So it is true that that's the intention of having blind servers. But I've actually been curious about whether sighted people could do the job. And I, I bet there are some sighted people who could get used to it, but possibly for public relations reasons as well. These servers definitely have, are supposed to be blind or visually impaired, although some do have a certain amount of functional vision that, of course, they don't use in the space. In researching where there are various dark restaurants on the web after this interview, I discovered that in one of them, the wait staff is fully sighted and they wear infrared goggles. Cheaters. So I'm curious, this may be a little bit nitty gritty of how the system works, but my concept of a restaurant is there's a whole bunch of people sitting at a whole bunch of tables and a handful of servers, and they're all going back and forth along the same pathways and in and out of the kitchen and the doors only so wide. Was there any issue of people colliding or did you guys have some system of managing to know where everybody else was at the right time? I won't say collisions never happened, but we definitely did have a system. Uh, the room that I worked in was 
long and narrow ish and it had a open lane type space down the middle of a bunch of tables and so as you were walking one direction in the room you were meant to be on one side of that aisle and when you were walking the other direction in the room you were meant to be on the other side so that you're following sort of a circle uh, which got a little difficult if your tables happened to be on both sides you had to sort of jog around and and you always had to be hyper aware of where the other server or servers in the room were and one of the tactics we used was just to call out now and then over here or you know just just make sounds to let the other servers know where you are but there's definitely a system in place so obviously the servers worked that out but you wrote a blog about your experience and i thought it was very well written and very interesting and i encourage anybody listening to this to go back and read the blog but you did mention that sometimes the customers who had not been trained would also be traversing the same space. <laughs> yeah, this is where my inner school teacher came out because occasionally, and they were pretty easy to spot, it was a certain demographic of young men. I actually, all of them, to a man, I liked them. They were really cool people and they were approached the experience with a real excitement, a real curiosity, but too much recklessness. And so what would happen is they would want to prove to themselves and to their girlfriends or whoever that they totally had this nailed this was easy for them. So they would want to do something like get up and walk around the table and pat their partner's head or even get up and, and go find the door and find their way back as a way to show, and, and possibly rightly, some of them were very good at it, that they were in control of things and they could navigate using other senses. The problem with this is they didn't know the system. And so here's me with three plates of really hot entree and here's adventure guy trying to make a point to everybody <laughs> and the consequences could have been absolutely disastrous and so say he gets burned or some other guest gets burned bottom line is i'm responsible and i'm going to have to deal with the consequences so i was really firm with them and i was friendly because like i said they were all really neat guys but i just became the school teacher which is very unlike me and i'd give them a lecture about how dangerous this was and why they weren't going to do it anymore and then if i didn't think he was hearing me i would engage his girlfriend and say just please control this guy <laughs> because he's being dangerous to everybody and I would keep having fun with them because they were invariably fun people just a bit reckless I was thinking along those lines I mean often we give advice to visually impaired people in new environments about how they can interact what's safe etc but the roles are kind of reversed here and I was wondering in addition to that was there any kind of special advice or tips you had to give to the sighted customers Definitely. I was all about information and making them feel comfortable, which and it was sort of satisfying for me because as a blind person, sometimes I get incomplete or non-existent instructions and it's frustrating. And I sort of enjoyed being really clear and, you know, as helpful as I could be in terms of giving accurate and pithy, precise information. So when we walked in, before we walked in, I would tell them a little bit about the walking in experience and how we were going to do it. And there's no steps, there's no obstacles and give them a little reassurance. And then I would just, as we go, okay, there's a door opening outwards on your left, reach out your hand for it. And then at the table, I would give them a thorough description of what items were on the table and where. And then each time I brought a new item, I would explain exactly where I was putting it. And if I was moved anything, I would tell them. Now, I think some people were so overwhelmed that they just weren't taking things in right away, but that's fine. They, you know, they had the information and eventually it all started to make sense. But I was always very careful to give all the information I could about the environment to reassure them and to sort of protect us all from spills and accidents. Well, it does take a while to adjust to a new way of doing things. Yeah, definitely. I, I was quite impressed by how, how well most people uh, coped with it. You must have run into some interesting disasters or accidents along the way, though, I would guess. <laughs> well, disasters or accidents... I would say there was maybe one spill per night, which when you think about it is pretty good, all things considered. If it was red wine, you know, not so good. And I think in my two years, I would honestly say I was responsible for one of them. Uh, yeah, so that's not too bad. And then she took it very well. <laughs> that was uh, that was a good thing. Yeah, that's a good record. I'm impressed. It is a good record. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm impressed too. It's not just me, though. I do think how few uh, accidents, uh, you know, those minor types of accidents happened. Yeah. Well, accidents happen even in the sighted world. I mean, you know, we're sitting in restaurants and you can hear a pile of plates falling occasionally or glass cracking on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. One night there was um, 
In in the restaurant, in the menu, you had an option that said surprise. And so there was one evening where a lady had chosen surprise dessert, which meant she didn't know what she was going to get, but she was gluten intolerant. And so this is something that can happen in any restaurant too, except that I brought her surprise dessert and it was a little cake with some mousse on it. And she sort of took one bite and went, uh oh, this is really, actually it wasn't gluten intolerant. It was something much more serious. She ended up in the hospital anyway. Oh. And the thing is, if that had been a sighted restaurant, I guess you couldn't do the surprise thing. You could, but she would have looked at the cake before she ate it. So that felt kind of disastrous to me because it wasn't actually technically my responsibility to police that aspect of her experience. It was, you know, something happened in the kitchen as well. But you feel terrible, you know, because she said, oh, okay, night in the hospital for me. And, and I know that could have been avoided if I'd been a tight, tiny bit more diligent. So that kind of thing wouldn't have happened in a conventional restaurant. And yeah, I felt pretty bad about that. Was the menu special in any way to make it a little bit easier for people who are newly blindfolded? They tended not to give you big slabs of meat and ask you to cut it. A lot of the meats came cut for you already. Uh, there was no soup on the menu. And other than that, it was not a huge menu so that there was only maybe three or four entrees and three or four appetizers and three or four desserts to choose from. So uh, narrowing the array of choices helps sort of simplify things as well. Well, I can say as a sighted person, I would have trouble remembering a very long list in a menu that, you know, had 20 of each item. And, and I think many sighted people are like that because it's so easy for us to peek at the list again that we don't have to remember the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was easier for the serving staff as well, because what would happen is runners would come from the kitchen and meet you in a little sort of ante room uh, between the outside and the dining room. And they'd say, okay, table 14. And they'd list off the different dishes they were handing you. And so it was helpful for us too to have a smaller menu to choose from. Oh, that's interesting. Did they keep the wait staff out of the kitchen? Oh, yeah. I never went in the kitchen. And in fact, this rankled with me just a little bit on the website. The prospective guest is reassured that all of the kitchen staff are fully sighted, which I, I see why they say that, but it, it rankled with me a bit that they did. Having the runners is a practical thing. It's not necessarily a way to keep blind people out of the kitchen. There's a big space between the kitchen and the dining rooms. And so if the wait staff is going to be as attentive as they need to be, it's much more practical for there to be runners. But as as a side note that the website does reassure us that all of the kitchen staff is fully sighted. Well, not so much Pete, but I do know there are plenty of blind people who are excellent cooks. <laughs> you know, we've actually interviewed Christine Ha, who's blind, and she won the Master Chef competition. Uh -huh. And, you know, not with any kind of advantage or anything. She was just competing with everybody else. Of course, you will, both of you probably know one of the biggest questions random strangers will ask you is, oh, how do you cook? And so there's definitely a, a public void of information or a blank where, where it comes to food prep and cooking. So any restaurant who's employing visually impaired people is sort of must feel themselves obligated to point out, oh, don't worry, everything's safe. And, you know, there's no unfortunate things going on in the kitchen that you need to be worrying about because all the staff is fully sighted. So it's it's a double-edged sort of a feeling yeah, I get when I read that. Yeah, because I love to cook too. And, but mind you, I don't necessarily want to work in a restaurant kitchen either. That's a whole <laughs> other level of technique that I don't have at the moment, at least. <laughs> yeah, neither do I. Yeah. So you said before getting involved that you were a little bit dubious about the attitude and the atmosphere after you've done it for a couple of years, what's your impression now? I think it's great. I think that, like most things, people leave with what they came in with to a certain extent. So if your attitude towards people who are different is always going to be to categorize them as people who are different than me, you're going to leave feeling the same way. And you might think, well, that was really cool, but there won't be much analysis or, or broadening of, of your perspectives or anything like that. So... The other hand, if someone comes in with a very curious, open mind, they have a great time and they learn things. And if they are respectful going in, they'll be respectful coming out. And what I mean by that is is not to look at blind people as exotic sort of 
sideshow people, but just as people who are maybe experiencing the world in a different way and, and doing things in, in different ways. And I spent a lot of my time when I could just chatting with people. And I ended up sort of feeling like a bit of an ambassador for blindness because a lot of people, they see blind people on the street or ran into one or, oh, my cousin's husband or something. But day-to-day uh, -day experiences and especially ones where you can have a sort of genuine conversation aren't all that common and when there was time and running plates and things if it wasn't too busy people had lots of questions and and I, I actually enjoyed talking to them about all sorts of things from how do you do your laundry to you know how do you travel also every kind of question you can imagine and I feel that a lot of people I spoke to genuinely learned things and broadened their perspectives on how people live or experience the world. And for them, it was a real broadening experience and something really valuable. What do you think you learned from the experience? I learned what it felt like to be in control in a way that I had never experienced before. Because as a blind person, no matter how competent you are, when you're in a sighted context, sighted people are going to be able to assess a situation and react more quickly and easily. I, I would say that's sort of universally true, especially if it's a any kind of dangerous situation or something that's changing quickly, somewhere where there's a lot going on. And in the dining room, all of those people were in a completely unfamiliar environment. They were fish out of water, but I was just doing my thing. So I had a commanding presence in that room that I've never had anywhere else. And it's hard to imagine having anywhere else. Do any specific instances come to mind? There was an evening in the restaurant when a guest had a, a very, very bad reaction to being in the dark, which did happen sometimes, but there was some other things going on too. And things got quite out of hand. And this lady she sort of lost touch with reality and she was getting a little aggressive and she needed to be brought out into the light right now. And what happened there was that I had taken first aid and I'd thought about things, but you never really know how you'll react in a crisis situation. If you're the one situated to act, are you going to do the right thing? And that's something as a blind person that's it's pretty uncommon that that is going to come up because you know, sighted people can usually react more quickly. So in that moment, I did the right thing and I did what needed to be done to extricate this unfortunate lady from her terrible situation and then to reassure the other guests and keep working and try to make the night keep going in a way that made some sort of sense. And that was a really amazing experience for me because I found out that in a crisis, I do actually flip into practical mode and, and let's do what we need to do. And that was a big moment for me. It was really difficult and uncomfortable, but I did learn that about myself, which I don't know that I could have learned anywhere else. So at the end of the day, what was the general reaction to dining in the dark by the sighted customers? Oh, they loved it. They had a great experience. Maybe one in 200 people in the first five seconds said, nope, I'm, I'm out of here. Get me out of here. And But uh, for the most part, people had a great experience. For some people, it took them, you know, a few minutes to half an hour to relax and, and not be frightened or uncomfortably disoriented. But most people left saying, wow, that was that was a really amazing experience. And whether that meant that they learned something profound about how other people live, or maybe it just meant they had a, a really trippy time. That's okay too. But uh, in the, in general, most people, yeah, they seem to really enjoy it. And the, the more thoughtful people among them were grateful to have an experience that helped them understand how some other people in the world live their life. Photo the hero that bore him back home place that he'd known as a lad They laid him to rest with his head inside out And his wand snapped in two, which was sad That was the ballad of Odo the Hero, an original song written and performed in all of its parts by Christine Malik. And the song was inspired by a ballad that J.K. Rowling refers to in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Now for this week's final item, how to find a dark restaurant that you might be able to go to and how to get Chris's book and blogs, as well as how to contact her directly. 
So I take it there are a number of such opportunities around the world. Is there any easy way of finding these or one just does a Google search? I would say a Google search is your best bet. I know in Canada, there's one here, there's one in Montreal, and I think there's one in Vancouver, and in the States, New York City, and I'm not sure where else. Yeah, I know there are dark restaurants in Boston and San Francisco, as well as around the world in Paris, Melbourne, Tel Aviv, and more. So they're all over the place. They are all over the place. And I really... I'm surprised that more people don't try to get those jobs because it seems like they're sort of always short one or two people. And it's an incredible experience. It's it's exhausting. And I gave up doing it a couple of years ago, but it's fascinating. It's by far the most fascinating work experience I, I ever had for so many reasons. After we completed the interview, I did a Google search and I found dark restaurants in at least a dozen different countries and multiples in some of those countries in Europe, Asia, North America, and Australia. So for anybody who happens to be in Toronto, can you give the name and address of this particular restaurant? It's called Au Noir, so O apostrophe N-O-I-R, which uh, means darkness or blackness in French, and it is on Church Street. Oh, so that's right downtown near Young and Bloor. So you mentioned your blog a little earlier. Can you tell people where they can find your blog and more information about your publications? Yeah, definitely. Uh, my website, I will spell it after I say it, is BeltaneTheBook.com. So B-E-L-T-A-N-E, TheBook.com. And that site has links to my my HF book, but there's also lots of stuff on there for free, which includes uh, lots of wide-ranging blog posts and my fan fiction and some audio documentaries and a bit of music. So there's lots of stuff there to check out. So anyone who would like to, uh, please drop by. And what formats is this book available in? It's available on all of the classic ebook sites, so Amazon and, and Apple and any mainstream ebook site. Unfortunately, it's not available in audio yet, but there is some audio material on my site. Where would people find the blog piece that you wrote about your waitressing experience? That is available from the Lighthouse in San Francisco. They have been posting writing from blind and visually impaired writers. If anybody wanted to reach you to ask you questions, do you have any contact information that you would like to share? My website has a contact form and that any messages sent through there will come to me and I would be happy to chat with people. And do you have a social media presence? I do. Twitter is my favorite and I'm just, I'm Christine Malik. So C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-M-A-L-E-C. That's my preferred social media presence is Twitter. As usual, you'll be able to find all of that contact information in the show notes associated with this episode at www.eyesonsuccess.net. That's it for show number 2149. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking about the VoxMate app. The number and complexity of gestures required to operate today's smartphones and tablets can make operating such devices a daunting task for those who are less technically savvy. We'll speak with Gleb and Katya, the founders and developers of the VoxMate app for Android that offers an innovative solution to using these devices with just a few gestures instead of the many that you might be used to. And if you want to hear about that exciting new innovative app, join us next week. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy Goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.